Okay, welcome to the third lecture in the NYCDS colloquium series and to uh, the Hofstra event series for National Public Health Week. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Melissa Randazzo from Adelphi will introduce the speakers in a second, uh, but I just want to make a couple of quick announcements. First, I want to plug an event that's on Thursday at 4 p.m. as part of National Public Health Week at Hofstra. The event is called The Scope of Practice of the SLP and Audiologists During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Uh, it'll be conducted by two faculty at Hofstra, Susan Dimitropoulos and Wendy Silverman. I'll put the RSVP link in the chat in case anyone is interested. And the other thing is regarding CEUs, uh, Max Freeman of St. John's uh, will put the, the CEU form in the chat uh, toward the end of the event. And with that, I'll turn it over to Melissa Randazzo from Adelphi, who will introduce the speakers. Thank you, Scott. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're so excited to have you all here today. I'm going to introduce the speakers. I'm going to just introduce our first speaker. And then um, we have two more speakers after that. So I'll introduce each of them before their respective talks. Our first speaker today is Dr. Ashwini Namasavayan McDonald. She is assistant professor and a speech language pathologist at McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada. She is a prolific researcher in the area of swallowing. She studies the determinants and consequences of dysphagia in older adults. She was awarded the 2020 recipient of the American Speech Language Hearing Association's Award for Early Contributions in Research, and she was recently awarded an NIH grant to study COVID and swallowing. Thank you, Dr. Namasavaya McDonald. We are excited to hear your talk today. Thanks so much for having me. I'm just going to share my screen here. Can everyone see that? Yes. Perfect. Great. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Randazzo, for inviting me to speak today. So I had the pleasure of working at Adelphi University for two and a half years before moving back to Canada, just before the pandemic hit. And I was just telling everyone I miss New York every single day. Um, my research focuses on swallowing and swallowing disorders in older adults, as Dr. Randazzo suggested. Um, and in spring 2020, I actually um, started working closely with Dr. Lu Luis Raquelme, who is an associate professor at New York Medical College. And um, we basically develop recommendations for SLP practice in acute care with patients with COVID-19. And we're currently working on a follow-up paper to summarize um, available evidence that supports our recommendations. Um, I have also helped to establish rehab guidelines for COVID-19 with my colleagues at McMaster, so alongside uh, PTs and OTs. And I'm now collaborating on a project with Dr. Katrina Steele at Toronto Rehab, uh, rehab Institute and Dr. Emily Plowman at the University of Florida, where we're trying to learn about the impact of COVID-19 on swelling function. So I'm very interested in this topic and I'm pleased to share some information with you today on the manifestation of dysphagia in patients with COVID-19. So here are my disclosures. So in order to um, you know, talk to you a little bit about dysphagia and COVID-19, I'm hoping to first you know, build up the story and, and tell you a little bit about COVID-19 symptomology, talk to you about dysphagia-related COVID-19 research, so mine and others, and then just briefly discuss possible treatment options, because I think that's the big question right now. So just a little disclaimer before we move forward, um, because there are thousands of publications on this topic, this presentation is not comprehensive. It can't be comprehensive in terms of research, but I've attempted to gather and summarize the most relevant research for you as of March, 2021. So first let's talk a little bit about symptomology. So the course of COVID-19 can be divided really into three stages. And the first early stage includes viral replication. And it's associated with this mild flu-like symptoms, such as fever, dry cough, and fatigue. And sometimes there are no signs or symptoms at all. So in this image, we see the most commonly reported symptoms of COVID-19 in this early stage. The second stage includes viral pneumonia um, and exacerbated inflammation of the lungs. And in this stage, patients tend to experience hypoxemia, which is a low concentration of oxygen in the blood, along with fever and dry cough. 
And the earliest signs of hypoxemia are confusion, restlessness, and shortness of breath. So shortness of breath is really key in relating things back to dysphagia. And then finally, in the third stage of COVID-19, there is this transition to a hyperinflammation state and um, really low blood sugar is what we're seeing. So a recent systematic review looked at 148 articles um, that included over 24,000 patients total. So this review found that about 17% of hospitalized patients who were in the second and third stages of the virus required non-invasive mechanical ventilation. Now this means that they needed oxygen via a face mask and didn't require an endotracheal airway. This review also found that 17% of patients required intensive care and 9% required invasive ventilation, meaning some sort of tube was inserted directly into the airway to deliver oxygen to the lungs. And if you think about that, that tube being inserted can, um, can also cause damage to the laryngeal mucosa and um, which is directly involved in swallowing. So an important um, thing to keep in mind. So here we see um, a table from another recent study detailing the signs and symptoms of patients infected with COVID-19 during hospitalization. So this is really early data, and we now know that people also had loss of smell and taste, as well as blood coagulation leading to strokes in the most severe cases. Um, if we bring our attention to the column outlining um, symptoms of severe cases, we see that um, similar to that, those mild stages, the most common symptoms are um, this fever and then the um, cough, so the dry cough. So as you can see, there's a whole host of different things that happen. And, and I think that's what's so challenging about addressing um, COVID is that these patients are, are very complex. So we also know that people, many people suffer from ARDS, so acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is a life-threatening respiratory failure. And the severity of ARDS is classified into categories of mild, moderate, and severe, depending on the degree of hypoxemia. Now, patients with moderate to severe ARDS require invasive mechanical ventilation and generally have a pretty poor prognosis. Another review was able to incorporate data from individual studies for which data was available and found that among hospitalized COVID-19 patients, approximately one third develop ARDS. About a quarter required transfer to ICU, 16% received invasive mechanical ventilation, and unfortunately 16% died. Um, for COVID-19 patients transferred to an ICU, about two-thirds received invasive mechanical ventilation, and about 75% um, had ARDS. The mortality rate of ICU COVID-19 patients was 40%, and 59% for those who received invasive mechanical ventilation. The mortality rate in COVID-19 associated with ARDS was 45%, and the incidence of ARDS among non-survivors of COVID-19 was 90%. So clearly this respiratory distress um, is a huge issue and, a, and, and an indicator of um, poor prognosis, of, as, as I suggested before. So another recent study looked at some of the more persistent symptoms of COVID-19 about three and a half months post hospitalization and found that about 40% of people continued to suffer from dyspnea or shortness of breath. So that's three and a half months out. And we had over 50% of people reporting um, fatigue. And a, about a third of people also reported memory loss and trouble sleeping. So how do all of these symptoms impact dysphagia? Well, in the early stages of the disease, loss of taste and smell may indicate cranial nerve damage. So more specifically, loss of taste may indicate damage to cranial nerves seven, nine, and or 10, which could ultimately influence both the oral and pharyngeal phases of swallowing. If someone is reporting difficulty breathing, we need to be on the lookout for impaired respiratory swallow coordination, 
which will increase the risk of aspiration during the swallow and aspiration pneumonia. And for those of you who may not be familiar with swallowing, um, just a quick um, reminder that we actually seize breathing. We have a, a, a period of swallow apnea um, in order to close the airway during the swallow. So in functional swallowing, we actually stop breathing for not very long, not even a second um, to protect our airway. So we need a respiration and swallowing to be really nicely coordinated. So if it's not coordinated, we're um, basically keeping the airway open perhaps during swallowing, which increases our risk of aspiration. So aspiration is material entering the airway and moving um, into the lungs, so below the vocal folds and into the lungs, increasing our risk of aspiration pneumonia. So that's um, pneumonia caused by this bacterial infection because something is, a foreign material has entered the lungs. Um, another thing to consider is that a sore throat could lead to painful swallowing, which might in turn lead to people swallowing with less effort, leading to increased oral and pharyngeal residue, so material left behind in the swallowing tract post-swallow, or they may be eating less because of this painful swallowing, which is a risk factor for malnutrition, and a lot of my work has suggested that um, dysphagia um, is a big contributor to malnutrition. Um, finally, invasive mechanical ventilation can impair airway protection if there is any damage to the laryngeal mucosa or vocal folds upon intubation or extubation. So I know this is confusing, but we're going to go through it um, row by row. And I'd like you to really consider some of the more general effects of COVID-19 on long-term outcomes. So first we know that many patients are being treated with dexamethasone, um, which is a corticosteroid primarily used as an anti-inflammatory and for its immunosuppressant effects. So some things to be aware of if you have patients who are taking or have taken this drug is that it's associated with ICU acquired weakness, which will increase risk of dysphagia. So ICU acquired weakness is clinically detected weakness in critically ill patients in whom there is no plausible etiology other than the critical illness. Mechanical ventilation is also a risk factor for ICU acquired weakness and is a barrier to mobilization. We know that this will increase risk of aspiration pneumonia in the presence of dysphagia and will increase fatigue. Many patients in the ICU are also being sedated, which leads to delirium and is another barrier to mobilization. Once again, increasing the risk of aspiration pneumonia, reducing cognition, and increasing risk of dysphagia. Proning is another treatment method found to be effective in patients suffering from COVID-19. So some hospitals are actually trialing awake proning, but we know if people are prone while sedated and paralyzed, they're going to experience a lot of atrophy and weakness, which will once again increase the risk of dysphagia. I think you can see the pattern here. Some patients are also given neuromuscular blockers to assist with acute respiratory distress syndrome or that ARDS that I talked about before. And the main side effect um, of these is that we, that we should be considering is really impaired cognition. Lastly, we really need to consider the impacts of the current visitation policies or really lack thereof for many of our patients right now. Because of the isolation and associated distress for both patients and their families, we're likely to see a lot of post-intensive care syndrome. This is made up of health problems that remain after critical illness. And they are present when the patient is in the ICU and may persist after the patient returns home. So many of these patients suffer from continued ICU acquired weakness, impaired cognition, and post-traumatic stress disorder, which I don't think we're really thinking about right now. And they often have anxiety and depression, which might ultimately affect their motivation to participate in swallowing therapy or really any other type of therapy and or their adherence to any recommendations we give. We also know that those who have less visitors are less likely to mobilize while in hospital, which increases risk of atrophy, dysphagia, and aspiration pneumonia in the presence of dysphagia. And then lastly, I didn't include it on this chart, but we, we know that people are also being given anticoagulants to prevent strokes and then remdesivir, but these have fewer side effects and are likely, unlikely to really directly affect SLP practice. And then I just want to bring your attention um, to this really seminal paper um, to help us think about 
the physiologic factors related to aspiration risk as laid out by Drs. Katrina Steele and Julie Chicaro. So this was this is not specific to um, patients with COVID, but I think it's uh, broadly applicable. And you'll notice that the last three points revolve around respiration, which we know will be impaired in patients with COVID-19, suggesting that they are once again at an increased risk for aspiration. So many patients are reporting chronic respiratory fatigue and difficulty breathing. So these are just some physiologic factors that we can keep in mind. So as we considered the effects of COVID-19 on long-term outcomes, you might have noticed that the reoccurring theme was that COVID-19 increases risk of dysphagia for a variety of reasons. And in turn, dysphagia can lead to increased risk of aspiration pneumonia, increased length of stay in hospital, increased risk of readmission to hospital, increased risk of malnutrition and dehydration, and increased risk of mortality. So therefore, it's extremely important that dysphagia is properly managed in patients with and recovering from COVID-19. So I'd now like to share some new information presented at the Dysphagia Research Society meeting in March that might help to understand how dysphagia manifests in patients with COVID-19. So um, this first study was conducted by Dr. Michael Puglia um, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and he looked at patients who entered the emergency department with COVID-19. He found that of the 134 patients enrolled in his study, 24, or about 18%, presented with dysphagia. And ultimately, he found that one in six patients presenting to the emergency department had dysphagia, but only nine participated in a bedside assessment and 16 participated in um, a video fluoroscopy, video fluoroscopy assessment of swallowing. So that's an x-ray video swall um, assessment of swallowing, which is our gold standard assessment modality. And when controlling for several other factors, Dr. Puglia found that dysphagia is an um, significant independent risk factor for severe COVID-19. So um, that's really unique and the first time that's really re been reported in the last year. The next study presented by Dr. Courtney Tipton looked at the makeup of COVID-19 patients diagnosed with new onset dysphagia with the aim of understanding great risk factors and complications. So she enrolled 78 patients and found that patients waited on average 11 days before seeing an SLP, which may represent delays in care. She also found that about a quarter of patients resumed a normal diet upon discharge, meaning that most patients were actually discharged on a modified diet. So meaning that you're eating, drinking thickened liquids or maybe eating soft salads or puree. So not eating what you and I um, typically eat. She found that about one fifth required a tube feeding at discharge. Although post-intubation dysphagia is thought to play a significant role in dysphagia associated with COVID-19, um, Dr. Tipton found that only 51% of patients enrolled in the study were intubated. And she found that patients with new onset dysphagia required significantly more consulting services and had a significantly longer length of stay than those who did not present with dysphagia. So that, um, that aligns well with the um, pre-pandemic uh, data I presented before. And so together, these studies really show the importance of SLP involvement from the onset of a COVID diagnosis, especially if there's a pre-existing dysphagia. And management of dysphagia may help to reduce the severity of the symptoms associated with the virus, as well as length of stay and number of healthcare team members involved with patient care. So importantly, these studies suggest that patients with COVID-19 might require long-term rehabilitation for their swallowing difficulties. So that brings me to the NIH-funded study that I'm conducting with Dr. Katrina Steele, who is the principal investigator, so I'm co-PI. And we are trying to understand the prevalence and pathophysiology of dysphagia and really understand the impact of dysphagia on other health-related outcomes with the intent of informing rehabilitation targets. So we are currently enrolling any adult patient previously diagnosed with COVID and are assessing swallowing physiology and collecting a host um, of other information, including whether they've been vaccinated, if they were hospitalized due to complications associated with COVID, um, if they've required mechanical ventilation, information about pre-existing medical conditions, any reports of dyspnea, and we are measuring um, tongue strength and cough strength. So essentially what we want to do is understand how all of these factors do or do not contribute to dysphagia and how this dysphagia is similar or different to swall um, swallowing difficulties 
that present in other patient populations. And we're hoping to really pinpoint targets for treatment, as I said before. So really, I'm sure you're wondering what treatment can you do until we learn more about pathophysiology of swallowing in patients with COVID-19. So I'd like to end by just suggesting two um, forms of treatment. Based on what is currently known about respiratory fatigue in patients with COVID-19, which could result in impaired respiratory swallow coordination, which I talked about before, respiratory swallow training may be beneficial. So we have no available data on the use of this technique with COVID patients, but it's an intervention focused on optimally coordinating breathing and swallowing. So typically um, we uh, look for what we call an exhale, swallow, exhale, um, pattern. So we expect people to breathe in, breathe out, swallow, and breathe out again. And that really helps to um, decrease the risk of airway penetration and improve key components of swallowing impairment. Um, uh, so essentially, we're targeting poor laryngeal elevation. So the larynx needs to elevate to help protect the airway during swallowing, um, which will so poor laryngeal elevation would lead to poor weight airway protection and reduced pharyngeal clearance. So um, more residue in that uh, swallowing tract. The thought is that swallowing during expiration facilitates movements required for laryngeal elevation to ensure airway protection and pharyngeal clearance. So if your breathing and swallowing is not coordinated, your airway must, may remain open during swallowing, increasing your risk of aspiration. And just, I want to you to remember once again that breathing and swallowing must be coordinated to prevent aspiration, right? We want um, the airway to close and we want uh, breathing to seize for a little, for really a second or two um, until the bolus or the food or liquid moves through the pharynx and into the esophagus. So another treatment option is expiratory muscle strength training, and this is an intervention involving block practice of exhalation through a mouthpiece fitted with a one-way pressure valve, blocking the flow of air until the patient produces sufficient expiratory pressure. And with this intervention, we are targeting poor hyolaryngeal excursion for airway protection and upper esophageal sphincter opening. So um, that's the sphincter at the bottom of the pharynx that really is the gateway to the esophagus. Um, and the theory is that if you breathe through this EMST device, you will activate the submental muscles um, that play a key role in facilitating hyolaryngeal excursion. So that's going to help elevate the larynx and close off that airway um, during swallowing. And I'd like to give a quick shout out to Danielle Breitz from NYU, um, who has done some really great research that's shown that higher excursion is best assessed instrumentally and is not reliably assessed at the bedside. So really this tells us that impairment should be identified via video fluoroscopy um, before treatment options are explored. So those are two treatment options um, that may be um, useful for patients with COVID-19. But like I said, we don't have any data on that yet. So in summary, I hope this presentation has made clear that patients with COVID-19 are at high risk of acquiring dysphagia. Dysphagia increases risk of severe COVID-19. SLP should really be involved throughout the continuum of care. Therapy should consider how respiration is affecting swallowing. So working, working closely with your um, respiratory therapists or PTs doing any chest work. And we are still trying to understand the causes of dysphagia and the optimal treatment targets for patients recovering from COVID-19. So thank you so much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them or you can reach out directly. Thank you so much, Dr. Nemesavaya McDonald. That was very interesting and informative. Uh, we do have one question in the chat and we have about five minutes. So if other people wanna raise their hands or uh, put a question in the chat, I'm going to go ahead and read out chat questions. Our first question is from Dr. Laura Koenig, uh, one of our speakers for today. She says she'd like to understand more about why proning can be a particular risk for atrophy and if this is about gravitational effects on the respiratory system or if there is something more to it. Sure, that's a great question. So it's actually a lot more simple than that. It's really the fact that they're not moving. So they're not moving, so that that's going to lead to the atrophy. We actually have it. It's actually the help with breathing. So they're actually it. That's the whole purpose of why they're put face down. But it's the fact that they're not moving, and because they're sedated also. So that I told I alluded to at the beginning that some people are doing this awake proning, but because they're sedated, 
they're really not moving. So they're sedated for long periods of time. And then we're, so we're basically seeing um, in general, so pre-pandemic data has suggested that um, people lose muscle mass at a rate of two to 11% per day when they're sedated and prone like that. So that atrophy um, is a big concern. And um, actually Dr. Sonia Melfenter from New York University does a lot of work on um, pharyngeal atrophy um, that I think in healthy participants that has really informed um, the swallowing world on the, um, the effects of atrophy on swallowing. Do we have any more questions for Dr. Namasavai and McDonald before we move on to the next speaker? Okay, I don't see any hands going up and I don't see anything else in the chat. We will stay on for a Q&A after all three speakers. Um, so please stay tuned if any questions occur to you. I'm going to introduce our second speaker now. I am excited to introduce to you Dr. Barbara E. Weinstein. She is professor and founding executive officer of the Health Sciences Doctoral Programs at the Graduate Center CUNY. She is also an adjunct professor of medicine at NYU Langone Medical Center. She received her PhD from Columbia University and she is the author of both editions of the Geriatric Audiology, um, she has also received the Asha Lewis DiCarlo Award, and she is a 2016 recipient of the New York State Speech, Language, and Hearing Association Distinguished Clinical Achievement Award. We are very excited to hear about her research today about COVID masks and uh, hearing. Dr. Weinstein, you are welcome to share your screen and start your presentation. Great, thank you. Here we go again. Let's see. That's weird. Hmm. So is, can you see my, is my screen visible? Is it visible? Yes. yes. Oh, great, okay, thank you. Um, so thank you very much. And um, I'm excited to share uh, some data with you. I um, just want to, just a little, just I want disclosure. Um, no, I, my financial arrangement is I'm a professor at CUNY and that my salary is paid through the Graduate Center. Um, I wanted to continue to build on what Dr. Ashwini said in terms of building up to the story. But before I do that, let me just share why I um, ended up becoming interested in this area. I was in, I was in the hospital with my 93 year old aunt on about March 7th before um, New York locked down. And um, what was most amazing was that the doctors and the healthcare providers were all wearing masks. And at the time there were about seven people in beds and they were all older and um, they had somebody with them. And the only thing, and you could only hear the doctor or the healthcare provider talking to the, per, the patient and then the patient saying, I can't understand you with your mask on. And then the family member answering. So fast forward to when we got on lockdown, I felt, I felt helpless as an audiologist. Um, everybody was, all these healthcare workers, everybody was making a difference and I was not doing anything except um, sitting in my home and um, going outside and clapping every night. So I, I decided to do an experiment because I noticed that um, speech understanding was impacted by wearing masks. So that is the, so I was, I did publish um, one of the first articles on um, masking, the effect of masking on um, speech product, speech understanding, um, because I was just motivated to do something and I had a firsthand experience. So I wanted to first share a little bit of a vi virology primer. Dr. Dr. Ashwani talked about the progression in terms of the physiological symptoms. I just want to talk about the progression in terms of the, the viral load. And I'll quickly go through this just as a reminder. So as we know that um, COVID is unique in terms of the route of transmission is through small respiratory droplets. And they're expelled many ways. They're expelled through coughing, they're expelled through sneezing, and they're expelled through speaking. So phonation, sneezing, and coughing actually produce a higher level of particles um, than breathing. Um, so speaking produces more droplets than coughing and louder speech actually creates a larger quantity of droplets than softer speech. 
So um, again, singing um, creates even more. So when a person speaks, he releases nearly 200 viral, viral particles per minute. So it would take five minutes of speaking face to face to receive a dose of particles large enough to infect others. And therefore, because of this, that we have some mitigation strategies which have been put into effect. And the um, mitigation strategies to stop the spread of, of COVID, as we all know, include wearing a mask and physical distancing, social distancing. And what's interesting is that these two mitigation strategies are the enemy of communication and the enemies of hearing. Well, of course, they are critical to um, mitigating the spread of the disease. So in terms of communication, as we all know, as being communication specialists, and I remember taking a course in interpersonal communication when I first started in this field, and I didn't know that it was relevant, but it certainly is relevant. And we know that that communication is a feedback loop. And in this feedback loop, the, the mitigation strategy masking impacts both the, both the sender and the receiver. And, um, and what we also know about communication is that communication is 93% nonverbal. About 55% is body language and, about, and we have a, a high proportion in terms of vocal tone and pitch of the voice. Much of this is masked through the vocal tone is impacted by the masking. Facial expressions are impacted of course in words. So body language um, takes on greater importance. So let's look at, so the consequences for communication can be deafening. It's conveying simple information is impacted, conveying empathy and reassurance impacted, speech is damped and voice is distorted, and there's limited interpretation of the facial expressions. So what I would like to do is go through a little bit of the science of this and, and the different, the studies that have been um, published. Um, my, my publication was in April, 2020. And since then there have been numerous publications as Dr. Schwani has suggested in the area of dysphagia. So in terms of social distancing, as we know, pre-COVID, we were, we were close to the speaker. In fact, with he we always advise um, hearing impaired people to always sit within three to six feet of the speaker. And now of course we have this physical distancing COVID, post-COVID. And what's interesting, some of you might remember this in your um, audiology class, which most of you um, in the audience decided to change to speech pathology, possibly because of um, some of these uh, laws that we went over. And what happens is there's this inverse square law and audibility. And, the, and basically the bottom line is the further you are from the speaker, the greater the drop in the intensity of the signal. So sound diminishes by approximately 6 dB for each doubling of distance. Um, and that's why we suggest that with hearing impaired people, you wanna sit between, speak between three to six feet, but we can't do that with COVID. So um, this physical distancing creates a barrier right away. Social distancing makes the voices softer as the further away from the speaker, the greater the drop in loudness. It's hard to see the speaker's face from a distance as well. So that's another issue as well. So there's a lot of mishearing what others are, are saying, making communication difficult as we all experience. So a little bit, so, and face masks is the next big mitigation strategy. And they're an ally when it comes to fighting the virus, but a challenge for persons with hearing loss. So what we know from facial expressions, by as I suggested before, by covering up the lower part of the face, transmission of vocal tone is impacted, facial cues and cues from the mouth and lips for speech reading are missing, visibility of facial expressions um, hidden and the face is hidden. So body language, as I suggested, takes on greater importance. So let's look at the, some of the acoustic impacts of face coverings. So as I suggested in um, beginning of April, I ended up um, being frustrated by being helpless and a colleague in Israel had written to me about um, some product that he was producing. And I asked him if he could in his lab um, help me figure out the effects of masking on acoustics of speech. So um, he actually in his, he has a very big technology company, audio simulators. So he said, sure, Barbara. So in 36 hours, we were able to get this study completed, written, and um, actually published. So, and here are the results. 
So what happens is, and, and at the time we had different masks, we had no mask, of course, the simple mask, N95 and N95. And uh, as you recall, in, those, in the beginning, in April, N95 masks, we were not, they were not available. We were not really permitted to wear N95 because that it had to be for the hospital workers. And um, there, were simple ma there, there were simple masks and we didn't have as many mask options as we'll see later on. A number of different masks have come on the um, market since, since the beginning of April. So what we know from this study is that medical face masks essentially serve as a low pass filter attenuating your higher frequencies where most of the energy, as you recall, is important for understanding speech. The high frequency con consonants are now rendered inaudible and because of the masks, they're not visible on the lips. So communication accuracy is severely compromised. And there's a differential effect of on, in terms of the different masks. And we'll see more research on this in other studies that were published later than this. And what we see here is that there's a differential in terms of between three and 12 dB with the N95 masks um, filtering um, many more, hot, having a greater filtration effect. And what we also know is that older adults are the most vulnerable to loss of auditory and visual cues. So people with hearing loss rely on visual cues to a greater extent than people who with normal hearing and with the hearing loss, because with hearing loss, we lose those high frequencies. And I'm gonna present the, the enemy of many speech pathologists is this audiogram. And if you recall with the audio, but this is your typical, this, is, this hearing loss is a little worse than um, what an older adult would experience, but most of your older adults, here you have your speech banana where most of the sounds of speech lie. In, importantly, the, the consonants as we know are important for speech understanding. And what's happening is that the hearing makes it difficult to hear many of those sounds of speech making speech inaudible. As nature would have it, those speech sounds as we know which are inaudible are visible on the lips so that people with hearing loss compensate by um, watching people when they speak. But of course, now we have the masking which is a double whammy. So the impacts of reduced tr speech transmission um, are, are significant and to what end we know that speech reading is impacted as well. And a recent study by Treca um, in an otolaryngology clinic in Italy verified this. And what they, what they did is they looked at persons with hearing loss who were, for, were referred from the emergency department to the otolaryngology clinics in Italian hospitals. This was early on in the pandemic, as we recall, Italy was profound, was severely affected early on. So in their study, 13% of persons re referred did not have any difficulties. So the majority of people referred to, ED to auto otolaryngology had communication difficulties. 25% presented with mild difficulties communicating, 37% with moderate, and about 23% with severe difficulties. And the main concern about face masks, of course, was the sound attenuation for 44% of the subject. But what they, the biggest problem was the difficulty in speech reading. So these individuals commented that hearing was impacted, but what really was, was problematic for the people with hearing loss was the difficulty speech reading. Speech quality degradation in combination with room noise and the absence of visual cues renders speech close to unintelligible for many of these people with hearing loss. And as I said before, older adults have the, are, are at, have the highest prevalence of hearing loss and older adults, as we know, ha are the most at risk for COVID so, and mortality from COVID. So this population is, is at great risk. So um, because of these, I mean, one of the, um, I think my, according to some researchers, the study that we did um, kind of stimulated interest in the different types of masks. And um, so this study early on by Corey, um, was interesting and he, at this point, we were able to have access to a number of different masks, including the face masks, the clear face masks. So what they did is they looked at the different, the effects of different masks on sound levels and they looked at a variety of different masks. And most of us um, are thinking in terms of the clear face mask because of the visibility of um, speech sounds. 
So what their study revealed was a number of different, they confirmed our finding was that most masks have little effect below 1000 Hertz, but attenuate higher frequencies by similar amounts to what we found. They found the surgical mask and the KN95 respirated had a peak into attenuation of about four dB. The N95 attenuated high frequencies by about six dBs. The cloth mask, as you'd expect, vary depending on the composition and the weave of the mask. But notably, the transparent mask performed poorly acoustically at the higher frequencies. So the transparent mask um, had the greatest impact in terms of filtration. And we know that a lot of people, especially um, with profound hearing loss, really need those transparent masks. And in their case, it's not a problem that there's this acoustic filtering. Um, which we'll come back to. So the bottom line with their study is that tightly woven cotton and condex bandex blends should be avoided if speech understanding matters. This, the ubiquitous polypropylene masks offer the best acoustic performance among all masks tested and the shape of the mask matters as well, how it had the tightness of the seal around the face. Shields and masks with windows perform worse acoustically than opaque cloth masks, and surgical masks are the least attenuating. So um, bottom line from their study, persons with hearing loss perform significantly better um, when listening to, a, to and watching a speaker wearing a, well, no, so let me just go back. So that, so the bottom line from their study was that the, um, the transparent masks are um, significant in terms of the attenuation, but you would predict that in terms of speech reading, they're definitely going to be better. And Thibodeau just hot off the press, just, just, um, just came out in print today. They did an interesting study looking at um, speech understanding with speech masks. And what they found was that persons with hearing loss perform significantly better when listening to and watching a speaker wearing a transparent mask over an opaque mask, which is not surprising, but it's important to have this data. Listeners, and interestingly, in terms of confidence, listeners felt more confident when listening to and watching a speaker without a mask than when listening to and watching a speaker wearing a transparent mask or an opaque mask. So these were people with all different types of hearing different severities of hearing loss. Confidence in rate is rated significantly higher for the transparent mask compared to the opaque mask condition. And listeners reported having to concentrate less when communicating and watching a speaker with a transparent mask and fatigue and listener fatigue and concentration is very, very important because when people are fatigued, when they're kind of trying to listen and communicate, oftentimes they tune out if, if there's too much fatigue. So that's gonna be another contribution to um, mishearing. And again, this, this study is just hot off the press. It's just came out in print this morning when I woke up. And I mean, I had, see, I had read it beforehand, but this is just now, out now. So now we're in healthcare settings and you folks are working in healthcare settings. You folks are working with people obviously with dysphagia and um, hearing is obviously one of the, one of the many um, problems that, that your patients will face. So what are the impacts in healthcare settings? Um, effective communication, as we know, is critical in healthcare settings. Um, adherence is very, very important. And I know that Dr. Schwenny commented on adherence with your patients with dysphagia. Um, if you can't hear the instructions from the physicians or the healthcare providers, speech pathologists, it's hard to adhere. Um, so, um, there are significant clinical impacts to effective communication. This was prior to COVID, we know about this. And some of the impacts, communication, as we know, is at the heart of delivery of healthcare. It's a critical to the um, healthcare provider relationship. It's critical to developing trust with the speech pathologists and the physicians and the therapists. Understanding complex concepts is critical in healthcare settings and treatment adherence, as we know. So communication is, that, is at the heart of healthcare delivery and hearing is an important part of that feedback loop. So life as a patient before COVID, they actually, before COVID, people with hearing loss had difficulty providing information, information to clinicians and caregivers. They had difficulty understanding treatment options. They had difficulty following treatment recommendations they had less participation in decision-making. 
and they rated their care less, um, less, they were less happy with their care in healthcare settings prior to COVID, higher re hospital readmission rates for persons with hearing loss prior to COVID. And now we know, and now post COVID, we have things very much exacerbated. Of course, again, we have difficulty providing information. Mass makes it difficult to interact with the healthcare providers. It's hard to understand, need to focus. If someone is going to operate, it would be good to see their face. Patients in the operating room don't get to even see the face of their surgeon and difficulty understanding healthcare providers from respiratory therapists to AIDS to speech pathologists. So again, um, the COVID is impacting healthcare delivery. And um, a recent study that just came out last week or the week before, looking at communication between surgeons and patients. And um, these Kratzky and colleagues looked at patient perceptions of surgical communication, trust in surgeons, patient impressions of surgeons' masks, provision of clear and understandable instructions. And they um, conducted an RCT, but just, just to give you a feel for what it sounds like in the operating room. <laughs> Do you have any questions about that? So that's the doctor talking and the surgeon talking prior to the um, surgery that he was going to be performing on this patient with a cholesteatoma. So the, um, an RCT, these guys performed an RCT and um, surgeons were randomized to wearing either standard covered masks or clear masks. So here you have your standard cloth mask or you have your clear mask. And there were 15 surgeons who participated and there were 200 patients who participated in this study. And the outcomes I thought were kind of interesting. Um, I'm not sure if they were surprising, but they were kind of interesting. The surgeons, 53% said they were unlikely to choose the clear mask over their standard covered mask. They, they lack confidence in the protection provided, provided by clear mask. And I think we know that that they're not, they don't, they're not as effective in terms of preventing spread of the virus. Patients, of course, prefer the clear mask to the standard mask. It improved surgeon communication and appreciation for visualization of the surgeon's face. Mask created verbal and nonverbal barriers. Easy to hear the surgeon when wearing a clear mask and able to visualize um, nonverbal visual cues. Those are some of the comments from the patients. And when surgeons wore a close mask, clear mask, the patients rated their surgeons higher for providing understandable explanations, demonstrated higher empathy levels and better able to build trust. And the type of mask did not impact comfort level with surgeon doing operations. So whether it was a clear mask or a material mask, that didn't matter. So um, we know that in some hospital settings, um, some, sometimes clear masks are provided, especially to patients that have significant hearing loss. Um, so they can communicate better with the, um, the physician or healthcare provider. So, and then there's a, recent, a study, again, this was again, 2021 um, that was published, um, impacts on communication experience. This was a study done in Manchester by Gabby Saunders and colleagues. And what they looked at was, how, how, pay, how individuals perceive com the communication experience based on the need to wear face masks and um, social distancing. And this study was done at the time when um, the UK was on lockdown. And what, the, what, the, what Gabby Saunders and her colleagues found was that face coverings change the content of and perceptions about an interaction. And I think these have some clinical implications for speech pathologists and audiologists when communicating with, with patients. Communication became about more about information sharing with little or no informal chat. These are the perceptions of the people, the respondents. Um, conversations tended to be shorter, flowed less well, they were less personal and engaging. Emotions and reactions were hard to read according to individuals wearing masks. And these are not in hospital settings. This is in different, a variety of different settings. At a cognitive level, participants reported need to use extra concentration and effort to communicate and that they were more fatigued following communication with someone wearing a face mask. And that is going to affect the ability to understand, hear, understand, and the ability to remember because at that point people will tune out. So the Hearing Loss Association of America was interested in, and Cochlear Corporation, they were interested in looking at the effects of face masking on communication in persons with 
um, hearing loss. And um, so they, they surveyed and they found that 95% of people living with hearing loss in the US said the face masks impacted their communication. 68% of those with hearing loss said it increased their use of technology during the pandemic to communicate with others. And 87% of hearing healthcare providers said they had seen an increased signs of loneliness or isolation in their patients since the pandemic began. So uh, Bar Barbara, um, yeah, very sorry to interrupt. Um, we got about five minutes left. Does that, that sound good? That's good? Yeah, that's good. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks. So um, what we know is that hearing from the pandemic um, and based on the HLAA work, 70% of persons with hearing loss said they're more aware of the hearing loss due to pandemic. That could be a good thing for audiology and speech pathology. 47% said they're more eager to explore hearing loss solutions. That's a very good thing for some audiologists. But 46% that said that hearing loss influenced their mental health in terms of increasing anxiety, isolation, loneliness, confusion, and forgetfulness. And we know that Dr. Schwenny touched on isolation, anxiety, and depression in persons with dysphagia following um, discharge. And 52% said they feel less connected to family and friends as a result of their hearing loss during the pandemic. So solutions. There are a lot of, there are a number of solutions. So I just wanted to offer some tips for communication. And these are, these are things that you ordinarily would do with people um, before masking, but there are certain things that you can't do when people wear masks that you could do when they were not masked. You want to make sure the room is well lit and speak to the other person well, the, the well lit is, is really in terms of seeing the eyes because the eyes are gonna relay a lot of information and also seeing body language. You wanna make sure to speak clearly and slowly, try to possibly use a more of a low pitch voice because um, that's less attenuated. Try to keep the sentences short. Um, when you're starting a conversation, try to address the person by name so that you, they know that you're talking. Avoid changing topics or interrupting others Shouting is not going to be helpful, and if a hearing aid is an option, it's is not is not an option. Use of assistive devices is very very important. In terms of people with, with face masks, make sure that um, you turn down background noise. Make sure you communicate one person at a time. Confirm that your statement is understood. Teach back is helpful. It's helpful if there's a friend to help communicate. Although people with hearing loss don't want others to communicate for them. They want to be spoken to directly. And for, for folks um, that have significant hearing loss, there's a lot of wonderful apps that are available. And these could be helpful for, for you when you're working with some of your dysphagia patients. Just some apps, and I could send you these if you're interested. There's speech to text apps. There's smartphone amplification. There's caption television. So there's a lot of different, and there's text to speech apps. So there are a lot of different apps on the phone that you can use to help individuals understand. And then we have here, many hearing aids have remote microphones. So the use of remote microphone stuck inside the inside of a mask, for example, a clear window mask can help. So if patients have hearing aids and have those remote microphones, those can be very helpful as well. So in closing, um, in terms of audiology, hearing loss may be a disrupt, um, dis the COVID vaccine, COVID virus may be a disruptor in terms of the fact that many individuals with hearing loss and their loved ones are now realizing how important hearing is and connection is to our overall quality of life. While the pandemic has challenged our ability to hear and connect, this realization is empowering consumers to act and seek treatment for hearing loss. So in my view, perhaps one of the unintended consequences is maybe the stigma of hearing loss may be a little bit lessened. So in conclusion, mitigation strategies to minimize the spread of virus are essential. Mitigation strategies are, however, the enemy of persons with hearing loss. And let's use this opportunity to shine a light on the newly visible disability of hearing loss and disseminate solutions for members of the hearing impaired community. And thank you. Wow, thank you, Dr. Weinstein. Uh, that was such an uh, awesome and comprehensive presentation for 25 minutes. Uh, we really got a lot of um, informative um, and scientific knowledge in. We do have one question for you uh, from Monica McHenry. She wants to know in the surgeon study, 
the clear masks seem to fit poorly. Is that why the surgeons didn't feel protected? And if there are any versions of clear masks that fit better? Yeah, so there's one, there's one clear mask that's FDA approved. Those were not the FDA approved. That was a good question. Those were not the FDA approved masks. But there, there's, there is a clear mask, and I, if that person wants to email me, I can contact her with those. So there's one version of clear mask that's FDA approved that does provide the protection, but um, they're, short, they're in short supply, especially at the beginning. It was, it was impossible to get those clear, those clear masks, um, and so, and we know that the clear masks are not as protective if they're not the FDA approved masks. So that could be one of the reasons. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I imagine there is there is a trade off of um, fit protection and then uh, the speech acoustics. We have a question from uh, Dr. Laura Koenig, who is our, our next speaker. She says it's a technical question. She writes that putting a microphone inside a mask puts it in a moist environment. What kinds of microphones are suitable in that situation? So the, um, the these I'm talking about the hearing aids that come come with many hearing aids come with a remote microphone and um, we could just stick it into. So basically the person with the hearing aid clips it in, can clip it into an area under the mask. And um, the, since the clear mask is, uh, the shield for example is open, it's not gonna be a problem in terms of the, um, in terms of um, moisture. Um, the only thing would ha so yeah so but the clear mask the, the the remote mic if it's used it has to you have to worry about infection so if you can't just transfer it from one healthcare provider to a, to another but we have the um, we have other so yeah so that could be a technical problem but if you're using a a, um, a face shield that wouldn't be as much of a problem. Thank you, Dr. Weinstein. There seems to be some interest in uh, the clear masks and some of the other resources that you had in your um, slide. So if you wanna share with us, we can share later with the attendees or if you want to put any links in the chat um, during the next speaker, that would be welcomed. Okay. Thank okay. you so much, that was excellent. Okay, and now uh, I will introduce our, our final speaker for today, Dr. Laura L. Koenig. She is professor in the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders at Adelphi University. She is a research scientist at Haskins Laboratories and also a research affiliate at the Leibniz Center for General Linguistics in Berlin, Germany. She is a linguist and a speech scientist with a prolific history of research. Her work focuses on understanding how speech production differs across individuals, for example, varying in age, sex, and native language. She's also looking at establishing relationships between the physiology of speech production and the resulting acoustic output. She's going to talk to us about research regarding speech through masks today. Dr. Koenig, are you ready to share your slides? Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so. She's pulled up. Um, Monica McHenry in my uh, database. Okay, is that good? Can you see that? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. So I'm very happy that uh, Dr. Weinstein provided such a, a thorough review of recent literature um, because my talk doesn't do that at all. So I'm, I'm glad that that background has been established. Um, and the, the scope of what I'm going to present here is um, that this is a study that I, I must say is the brainchild of Melissa Randazzo um, and Ryan Prefer really did most of the legwork in terms of um, setting up the stimuli and the, um, the listening test. So very much a collaborative project. So I wanna recognize my collaborators here. Um, so thank you organizers for inviting me. And um, I wanna just, um, I'm hoping with this talk that I can add one small additional dimension to what we've been thinking about here today. <clears throat> So we have been thinking about um, in the recent talk about the effects of face masks, particularly how they affect listeners. But um, I want to um, also uh, point out with this talk that we want to think about the effects on speakers as well. 
Oops, sorry. So as we all know, um, face masks are effective in preventing the spread of COVID-19. But as we've also experienced and as we've learned through recent literature, they do have effects on the speech signal. They limit um, the acoustic transmission. They also limit visual information. I'm gonna hide my little window here. Um, and um, it turns out that as we have also been learning, masks not only differ in their efficacy at containing airborne particles that spread the COVID virus, um, but, but they can also differ in their effects on speech acoustics. And um, I'm ultimately going to suggest that they can also affect speech articulation as well. Oh, I'm stuck. There we go. So um, in other words, we can think of sort of trade-offs between mask efficacy in terms of virus transmission and communicative effects. And again, Dr. Weinstein has covered some of this literature more thoroughly than, than what I'm providing here. So the N95 masks are um, really superior in terms of protecting against virus transmission, but at least in some studies, they can attenuate sound quite a bit. So um, this 12 dB figure, um, I believe matches what was, one of it, what was in one of those previous slides. On the other hand, if we look at something like a simple cloth mask, depending on the nature of that cloth mask, they will offer less protection against the virus, but they may be superior in terms of their attenuating effects. So in some studies suggesting that maybe it's only three or four dB um, as far as how much they impact speech transmission. And um, I want to point out a methodological issue that arises in this context. Mm -hmm. So um, the Corey et al. study was one of the ones that assessed many different mask types. And as one of their conditions, they effectively masks onto human-shaped dummies. And certainly a piece of what we need to understand is how different material types affect acoustic transmission, which will affect listeners and what they can um, capture, recapture from the speech signal. But by sort of taking real speakers out of the equation here, that there is a drawback in these studies in that we do not learn about how masks can affect speakers. That is to say how masks can uh, impact speech articulation. And just to underscore this, if we look at the reported effects of mask wearing, <clears throat> we see that there are reports, of course, on, of effects on listeners. So listeners report um, reduced intelligibility when listening to people wearing masks. And um, as we know, these effects are exacerbated for persons with hearing loss, older persons, persons who are second language speakers. Um, all very important considerations for us. But masks affect speakers as well. So there have been studies in which speakers have self-reported that they perceive greater effort when speaking through a mask, that they feel they speak more loudly, they speak more slowly, they pause more. Um, and as Dr. Weinstein mentioned, these can, um, can positively impact communication for the listener, but they also have detrimental effects on speakers and their self-perceived efficacy. So in the um, under to assess the effects of three face masks, both on listener responses and the speech acoustics, we compared cloth masks, disposable masks, and the N95 mask. We looked at multiple speakers, two males, two females, and we uh, specifically chose speech material that minimizes semantic predictability to um, get a better sense of exactly what is transmitted in terms of the phonetic information in these mask types. So we obtained recordings from professional voice users. They were all actors. 
given you the technical details of our recording protocol. Um, I'm not going to read this all for you, except just to say that these were fairly high quality recording um, recordings in terms of the equipment that we used. Um, however, because of pandemic restrictions, we did not bring our speakers into the sound booth. We shipped the equipment to them and asked them to record themselves in their homes um, and to try and find a space that would have limited background noise. And um, in their Manhattan apartments, they did that to varying degrees of success. So that is um, somewhat of a drawback to our methods, um, but was sort of in, uh, unavoidable at the time. We had speakers produce semantically unpredictable sentences. Um, so McHenry and I forget the second author, but uh, this was a set of sentences um, designed so that they were mostly content words. They were all seven words long <clears throat> and you could not easily predict the end of the sentence from the beginning. So we processed these sentences to normalize them for amplitude. We mixed them with multi-talker babble to simulate real world conditions um, like that um, recording we heard of the, um, uh, of the operating room. <clears throat> and we, um, in each condition, speakers heard, um, sorry, in, yeah, in each condition, speakers heard different sentences. So I'm going to play you a couple of examples here. So this first one is the uh, control condition. So no mask, but with the babble. So here's the original in case you didn't get all of that. Here now is the N95 mask again right. with babble. Dr. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. The audio is not coming through. Um, I'm not sure you why. Know what? Let me take off my address. Let me try it now. Uh, instructors always allow pens before testing. Does that work? Yes, that, that worked. Thank you. Okay. So my sound will be less good, but you can hear the clips again. So again, that was the no mask condition with Babel. Here's the original. Math instructors always allow pens before testing. Here is the N95 mask with Babel. They begin mixing dangerous. And again, the original. They began mixing dangerous materials by beaches. So as you can see, or as you can hear, um, a moderately difficult listening task. Math instructors Oops. always allow pens before testing. Sorry. <clears throat> Okay, there we go. So our listeners, we recorded these folks through an online platform through Prolific. They did their testing online. Um, we did have some exclusionary criteria. We lost some listeners. Um, we can talk about that if you're interested. They all had to be native English speakers. I self report. They were all normally hearing based on their responses to the hearing handicap inventory. We told them about their mask use. Most of them did have uh, quite a bit of experience both speaking through masks and listening to mask speakers. And each listener heard data from a single speaker in all four conditions. And we did this because we expected there might be in intelligibility. So here's our intelligibility data. So this is presenting just percent words correct per condition. Um, and I wanna mention that um, intelligibility seems like a simple concept, but when you go about measuring it, it actually is kind of tricky. Um, so that is something that, again, we could talk about if any of you are interested. So a rather uh, simple measure right now, again, just percent words correct. And what we find is the C1 here, this is the no mask condition. So about 80% intelligibility with that babble. All three mask types did reduce intelligibility. No significant differences in our data for the different mask types. Qualitatively, the effect was biggest for the N95. Um, and one consideration that I'll toss out here, again, getting back to the way that we measured intelligibility, in our scoring procedure, a sort of miss 
So it's exactly the same as a non-response. So if you substituted delicious for delicate, that would get the same kind of incorrect word score as if you simply did not report anything for that word. And we did note in going through the data that those non-responses were more common for the N95 mask. We did find speaker differences, which were significant. So in this study, our two men down here at the bottom were more intelligible than the women. So in the no mask condition, about 80% intelligible. The two women um, intelligibility in the high 70s. For all four of the speakers at N5, those black bars were coming in as the least intelligible. So now to look at the acoustic effects of the mask. So for this, I just took the, the entire record for each condition. So those 48 sentences, that whole recording, um, I just did a long-term average spectrum over all of those. And I'm showing you the results here for one speaker. So the blue here, is showing the no mask condition. So this is intensity over frequencies up to 8,000. And what you see here is that all three of these mask types are reducing acoustic energy. But to look at this a little bit closer, we zoomed in on frequencies from zero to 4,000 Hertz to kind of pinpoint the frequencies that are most important for speech. And um, what I'm gonna be showing you in the next slide is the difference between the no mask condition and the three mask conditions. Okay. So here, the black at the top that is the N95 mask. So the fact that this is higher than the rest is indicating that that N95 is showing greater attenuation over a range of frequencies from about 700 Hertz up to about maybe 2,900 Hertz. And the cloth mask and the disposable mask are, less, um, are showing less attenuation in those frequencies. So what struck me about this is that this particular frequency range is, is quite important for speech communication. So up around 700 to 1000 Hertz, that is in the region of a high first formant, which are the frequencies that we associate with lowered jaw positions. So for example, like an ah kind of vowel. And then these frequencies over here, you know, 1200 up to maybe 3000, that's in the range of our second formant frequency, which carries a lot of important information on consonant place of articulation, also on the front back vowel distinction. And incidentally, this is consistent with um, just spontaneous speaker comments on feeling constrained when they spoke through that N95 mask, which does have to be fitted to the face rather, rather well. And um, this is brand new data. We did this for two speakers before. I've now got it for all four. All four of our speakers do show this pattern of higher attenuation over roughly that same frequency band. There is some, some variation in that. Um, speaker M1, who happened to be our most intelligible speaker, shows kind of an interesting little dip here at about 1300 Hertz. And I also wanna mention here that these Y scales are different. Um, so the magnitude is different for speakers. Um, a question that arises from this is whether these speaker specific differences in the acoustic attenuation have anything to do with intelligibility differences, um, which is a really good question. And we're gonna have to look into this. We, um, we don't have the data analyzed in a way yet that will show us that, but um, I certainly wanna follow up on it. So um, just to um, sum things up here, even though we did not find significant differences among our masks in this study, there is some suggestion that the N95 masks are different. Um, so again, in previous works, the suggestion that these do reduce acoustic transmission overall to a greater degree than their mask types. And additionally, they seem to be reducing particularly important frequencies for speech communication that we can understand in terms of a restriction on articulatory movement. 
So coming back to this notion of trade-offs, um, particularly if we are in a lower risk situation, if we are not necessarily in a healthcare setting with um, very at-risk populations, we might want to think about choosing our masks to, uh, partly as a function of how well they will communicate the linguistic signal. Um, additionally, I want to underscore that um, there are speaker effects that we need to think about in mask wearing. We did see speaker differences in intelligibility, which is no surprise. There's a lot of work showing that speakers just naturally differ in their clarity. We saw this in the no mask condition. So just intrinsic differences in how clearly speak people speak. Um, but at the same time, there, there seems to be possibly some speaker specific responses to mask wearing. And that may in turn affect listener success um, in terms of how well they can understand masked speech. So the, um, the bottom line takeaway message here is that um, mask wearing certainly affects listeners, but it affects speakers as well. So again, I want to acknowledge my uh, co-authors. Um, I also want to acknowledge our speakers who volunteered their time. Um, I also want to recognize the contributions of a number of research assistants supported by Adelphi University. And uh, portions of this work were presented at the Virtual Acoustical Society meeting in December. We also published a version of that work in Proceedings and Meetings on Acoustics. So I will refer you to that work if you are interested in the citations. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Koenig. That was um, an excellent presentation uh, to finish off our uh, COVID-19 on speech swallowing and listening. Um, we do have a couple of questions um, and they're kind of popping up um, in, in order. So I'm going to start first with Rachel Offram's question. She said, for audiologists conducting live voice testing for speech recognition, would your study then suggest that it, it is affecting the validity of the tests? And then if so, how should an audiologist account for it if they need to wear a mask when testing? It's a great question. And I'm not sure I have a great answer. Um, let me turn on my video. Um, so I'm going to back to the, the validity of testing how masks affect transmission without the human, but with the human. And my, my sense is that we just don't have a lot of data on how masks affect humans yet. Um, I, I think it's just something that we, we need to look into more. Um, does it affect the validity of the tests? It certainly is a complication, complicating factor. Um, but as we know, there's two kinds of validity. There is the internal validity. So speaker effects can be a threat to internal validity, I think. But as far as external validity, of course, um, most of us have mouths and articulators and we have to use them when we communicate. So for external validity, I think it's, um, it's potentially a plus, if you like. Dr. Weinstein, please chime in here. So that's really interesting. So I would say two things. I totally agree the external validity when doing speech word recognition testing with a mask will be, will be um, generalizable in terms of real life. But I would suggest that we use um, taped speech. So you use, I mean, the, instead of you doing monitor live voice, the, um, we know that um, using tapes are reliable, much more reliable and much more valid. And clearly that's, um, the way you should go in terms of um, in terms if you don't want to be impacted by the, um, the if you don't want the internal validity to be, to be impacted by speech testing. I would do it both ways actually. Thank you. Um, so we had one more question just if they were uh, single or double masked. So our speakers in the study were, were single masked. Um, but as soon as the recommendation came out to double mask, I was like, oh, we need to add a condition. Um, there's always going to be a new condition to add as the uh, situation is unfolding. Uh, any other questions? Um, oh, from um, Dr. McHenry, one slide suggested that the speaker's response to mask wearing was increased vocal effort which should improve articulatory precision. Do you believe this potential beneficial impact was counteracted by perceived restriction of movement? 
So um, increased vocal effort is an interesting one. Um, this was self-reported um, what listeners were <clears throat> aware of in um, how they were communicating through masks. And it's, it's hard to know whether they were responding to increased respiratory drive, just trying to get louder, um, increased um, vocal fold um, impact frequency, which you would expect from um, greater driving pressure. Um, when, when people think of increased vocal effort in clinical situations, that there is this notion that when you when people speak at greater effort, that it will increase speech clarity. Um, I, I will say that I've done some work with a colleague of mine where we just looked at the effects of loud speech in typical speakers. And um, it's not necessarily the case in typical folks that at least speaking more loudly expands the articulatory space, okay? Um, in certain kinds of clinical training protocols, that can certainly happen, but I don't think it's necessary. So, um, but the perceived restriction on movement um, is, um, yeah, it could actually, it could, it could totally be a counteracting effect on um, how much they increase clarity when they try and um, increase their effort. Oh, Dr. Weinstein, you're muted. Okay, so I wanted to just add to what Laura just said as well. So, um, and that's why in one of my slides in terms of suggestions for how to communicate, you don't want to, you don't want to scream. It was, that's, that increased vocal effort is not going to make your, your voice clear. It's not going to increase clarity. It's not going to improve understanding at all. So that jives with what, what Laura said. And I just want to also add that, you know, we talk about in healthcare settings, we talk about how the masks affect the patient, but we should talk about the fact that we have many um, healthcare providers that have difficulty understanding um, because of hearing loss or just because of the mass. And we have to be concerned that that, bi that, that bi-directional communication. So oftentimes the healthcare providers are going to misunderstand what the patients are saying. So that's like an extra, extra la layer of, prob of problem. And an additional source of stress for those healthcare providers if they are speaking more effortfully. Yeah, that's true. Another thing that, you know, also occurred to us was that the uh, masks are standard sizes and faces are not standard um, in size. And so there, there might be a, a wear and a fit effect um, as well to explore later on. Any other questions or comments? Any questions for um, all any of the three speakers, uh, we're in the last few minutes of the event. Uh, so it's just open Q and A. Feel free to raise a digital hand. Um, okay, uh, we're adding in the chat right now, Ryan Prefer's added our website where you can get more information um, about the events. We list our upcoming talks there and links to our previous talks. Um, also the link to our YouTube channel. Uh, and Max Freeman has also posted in the chat the links for the CEUs. So if you are a clinician looking for ASHA CEUs, please fill in this form and um, you'll be contacted um, regarding the CEUs for the event. Okay, I think uh, that's a wrap on NYC DCS number three. Um, thank you to our speakers. Uh, we know that this is a really busy um, and difficult time in a lot of workplaces. So we really appreciate you coming and sharing your work with our community um, and being part of this event that um, is going to really um, help us have more of a research discourse within the New York State community of, of clinicians and scientists. So thank you so much. I'm looking forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.